So, inertia. Uh-huh. Um, probably not one that sharpened. But let me look. Okay, you found one? Yeah, sorry. Usually I have a, a whole stack of them, but right now I'm out. Inertia and the law of inertia, also known as the Newton's first law. Newton's first law is called the law of inertia. And so as usual, we should probably, as usual, we should probably define what inertia is before we try to start using it. So what is inertia? Anything at rest will stay at rest. But what is inertia? Jacob, the question was, what is inertia? Not state for me the first law. Isn't inertia the first law? That's a statement of what happens due to inertia, not what is inertia. Oh, um, so what is inertia? I just remember being told inertia was basically the first law. It was the, the definition. So, um, is something will stay in motion? <laughs> okay. Anybody know what inertia is? Okay. So inertia is a property of mass or matter. resists changes in velocity. So inertia is a property of matter or mass that resists changes in velocity. So anything that has mass has the property of inertia. It is not a force. Forces are interactions, are pushes and pulls. And so inertia is this property that we have, we've given it a name, what mass behaves. And I think that's where maybe a little bit of the confusion was coming for Jacob, is that we have a definition of it, but the definition is sort of explained where it tells us what to see, what you see behaviors of from the first law. So the difference between a law and a theory, have we talked about that in here? Nope. Not talked about the difference between law and the theory? Okay. So we probably should start there. And I'll give you a minute to write because I don't want to go so fast that you get lost. It's not the goal. All right. So, laws and theories. In English usage, when somebody says a law, we immediately kind of jump to the idea of we have rules and regulations and courts of law and there are behaviors that are expected from our government. But in a science sense, a law is something that tells you what will happen, but not why. So a law in science tells you what will happen but not why. So it tells you what, not why, it happens. So Newton has three laws of motion. The law of inertia, first law, second law, and third law. And they tell us exactly what's going to happen. But we don't know why. We don't know why mass has inertia. That's one of the open questions in physics. Actually, we don't even know why we have mass. 
mass is still, I mean, you've been talking about mass your whole life probably in science class, right? Or matter, building blocks or atoms and all those kinds of things. But we don't really, really know what mass is. We have some theories that they're being tested, but these theories are not, these are hypotheses, not theories, because theories have another special piece in science. But a law in science is going to tell you what will happen. So I have Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law tells me positive charges are attracted by negative charges. But if you put in two negative charges close together, they repel. It doesn't tell me why. It just tell me that what that is exactly what's going to happen, not why it happens. Okay, so we have uh, the Biot-Savar law, which tells me how magnetism works, but not why it works. It tells me what's going to happen, but not why it's going to happen. So we have lots of uh, laws in science, and all those science laws tell you what's going to happen, but not why. A theory. Nope, that would be a hypothesis. A theory in science tells you why something happens, but not what will happen. So we have a theory of evolution. The theory of evolution explains why parents look sort of like both of their children. Or why if a couple of hamsters have babies, we expect to get little baby hamsters. But if you mate a brown hamster with a white hamster, it'll tell you how gene traits are decided, what's going on, but it won't tell you what color each one of the babies is going to be. Okay? So the theory of evolution tells us why something is happening. Sorry, I'm off the screen a little bit, aren't I? It tells us why something happens, but not what will happen. So we have a theory of probability. One of the theories of probability is if you flip a fair coin, it comes up heads. Half the time, right? If you come up heads about half the time. But it doesn't tell you if I flip it now which one I'm going to get. It doesn't tell me what to see. It tells me what is likely to happen and why. But isn't that like a coin where like one side is heavier than the other? So it's that would not be considered a fair coin. Oh. So a theory in science is the why part, the reasoning... And a law is tell me what's going to happen. So, Newton has laws. Thus, we have Newton's laws. Tell us what will happen with forces. So we have the first law tells us if the forces are balanced, the object has constant velocity. And constant velocity means we go in the same speed and same direction. Same speed, same direction. The second law tells me if the forces are unbalanced, the object must accelerate in the direction of the net force. Thank you, my dear. 
And the third law tells us all forces come in pairs. All forces come in pairs. So there's our three laws. So let's see how we do it recognizing these. Yeah, we do on recognizing these. I'll give you a minute because that was a lot of words to catch up on. Let me get those glued back on the ceiling. Uh, anything with the Paul Bray, by the way? Say again? You mean for class? What am I doing for Paul Bray? I don't know yet. My parents are living out to me at home while they get out alive. Hmm, fun. Yeah. I wish I did that. My mom's birthday is on the 3rd. So I don't know if I'm going to go to Arkansas or they're going to come here. Or if we're going to meet in Memphis because that's halfway. But we might do none of the above, all of the above, some of the above. That's that that's true. So if the forces are balanced, so here's, here's how this works. There's always, any time an object interacts with another object, there's going to be a force. Object interactions are described by forces. So we always have a pair. They always come in pairs. So some of you have seen the trick. It's not really a trick. It's actually basic physics. Where you have, bless you, where you have a whole table set and somebody comes along and grabs the tablecloth and yanks it out from under and all the stuff stays sitting on the table. You guys seen that? You know what I'm talking about? So there's a trick to it. The trick to it is that you pull horizontally, not pull down. Because if you pull down on the table, the stuff's going to fall over every time. But if you pull horizontally and there's not a lot of friction between the objects sitting on the tablecloth and the tablecloth, you'll be able to pull that out pretty quickly. What about, I know it's physics, but like, we take, like, let's say, a beaker full of water. Mm-hmm. Full of water. You put cardboard or something over it. Yep. Air pressure. Air pressure? Yeah. Then the water doesn't drop. Yep. Just like I can swing a cup of water in a circle and the water won't come out at the top. I swing at the right speed. Really? Really. I do it in physics too every year. Is it every month? No. So we basically spent. Yep, just like that. So the reason that trick works is because of inertia. All the objects on the table have mass, and therefore they want to keep doing what they're doing. Which, if you have laid a plate on a tablecloth, the plate will continue to sit there because of inertia. Just like if I have candlesticks or forks and knives. Those pieces will sit right there. They will keep doing what they're doing. They are at rest, so they remain at rest. Unless there's a force acting on them. Now, here's the deal. Is there ever a time that an object has no forces acting on it? No. Because there's always force. There's always gravity. Okay, Gravity is always going to be present with us. The only time we'll ignore gravity, and we do some space problems later in the year, but isn't gravity still there? It's still there. It's just going to be so small that it's not going to make a difference in the calculations. It's basically from this amount on Earth. Okay. So, on the, on the tablecloth, the friction is the issue. If there's too much friction, the objects will stick to the tablecloth and get pulled along with the tablecloth. But if it's a nice, smooth tablecloth, not a lot of friction... You will be able to do that. That would be a really good example of Newton's first law. Um, ice hockey is a sport that, for the most part, depends on the first law. Ice hockey depends on the first law because the players hit the puck and they pass it to each other, and you expect the puck to slide pretty smoothly to the other person. 
However, that doesn't happen very often because the ice actually gets roughed up pretty good by the skates. The ice on an ice hockey arena rink is only about three quarters of an inch deep. So when you look at an ice hockey rink, the amount of ice on the amount of ice is about that deep. From here to here. Three quarters of an inch. So if you thought the blade really cut into the ice, it doesn't. It doesn't cut very far down. And it's actually a lot wider than it looks. But they are still sharp, and at least once a year it seems like we have a player that gets cut up around the head or neck because another guy gets knocked over, skates come in the air. A couple of years ago was a horrific one where the guy got cut straight across the neck. And it was, they showed it, you know how they do, like broken legs and terrible accidents. They show them over and over again. You're like, please stop showing this. But ice hockey is kind of the closest we can get. Air hockey is another one because if you tap the air hockey puck, it's going to float down to wherever until it hits a wall. When it hits a wall, it's going to bounce off. Pool is very similar, but pool has the felt has a little bit of friction, so the pool ball will slow down and stop. So lots of sports that we use depend on this idea that an object will keep going in the same speed and same direction. As long as the forces are balanced. So what does it mean for our forces to be balanced? We've drawn enough pictures here, so we should have a good idea now. What would balanced forces look like? For a free body diagram. What should we see? <coughs> What's equal? The forces. Okay, how is it equal? In all four directions. So we we must have forces in opposite directions that have the same amount total of force. So, for example, we might see something like this. So which forces actually have to be balanced? When we talk about balanced forces here, we need these two to be the same amount, and we also need these two to be the same amount. You can have scenarios where you just have two forces, force normal, force gravity. That would be another example of balanced forces. So what we're going to do is horizontal, to be a little bit more specific, horizontal and vertical forces must add to zero. So our horizontal and our vertical forces have to add up to be zero to have balanced forces. Now, sometimes you can get these in kind of a weird way. You could also have balanced forces like this. That could be balanced forces. Is it because that friction and that ground do hold together for F of tension? Tension. So in this case, tension is pulling up and to the right. Tension pulls up and to the right. So we would expect our other forces down and left to be able to balance that out. So that might be balanced, but it also might not be. We'd have to actually do the math to figure that out. But that's something for later in this week. We'll practice with the um, 
the trig piece is a little bit later. Not today. At 16, I believe. Oh, so it's Nope. 17 was when we went before. I think it's just one minute off, but I'll look. Twelve sixteen. yep. Okay. So what gives us inertia? What is the key piece that gives us inertia? Let's run back through this real quick. Inertia is a property of mass. So if there's a big football player running down the field... It doesn't matter whether he runs fast or slow. It only matters if he's running. massive. Because mass depends on, your inertia depends on your mass. So to be more massive is to be, have more or possess more inertia. It's not a force, it's just a property. So in a collision, when you have something with a lot of inertia and something with a little inertia, think school bus and smart car, which one's velocity is going to change more? The car? The small car's velocity will change more because the bus has more mass. They experience the exact same force because that's the third law. They each get the same amount of force. But because of the mass of the bus, it only gets a small acceleration, a small change in its velocity, where the smart car will get a large change in its velocity. So basically, this is the bus. This, right here, is the car comes it through. Mm -hmm. And the car will... And it depends on where the car gets hit as well, but yes. Yeah, the yeah. forces will be identical they would when they hit. They slow down a little bit. The That's bus right. will slow down a little bit, yes. No, I'm talking about when they're coming through. Jacob, so, Jacob. It's enough. Too much. Yep, too much. Sorry. It's okay. All right, so you have two worksheets for me today on inertia and mass. Mass, the way we measure inertia is actually with mass. Mass is measured in kilograms in the British units, excuse me, in the metric system. In the English units, mass is measured in slugs. So you're probably not familiar with the unit of a slug. You're probably familiar with the unit called a pound. A pound is a slug foot per second squared, just like a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So we have pounds is equivalent to newtons. Pounds and newtons are the same measurement type, but they do not give you the same number. So Miss Alyssa over here, if she found her weight in English units, it would be a number much, much smaller than her weight in metric. Okay, just to give you an idea... Yes, please turn that off. Thank you. Um, if you were a person that weighed 100 pounds, 100 pounds here in the U.S., you would have about 50 kilograms would be your mass. So your weight in metric system would be 500 newtons. So here in the U.S., we'd report your weight as 100 pounds, but we would report your weight in Europe as 500 newtons. So that... Yes. Yes, they do. And since they're used to it, that doesn't sound terrible to them because they're used to it, right? But for us, if I say she weighs 500 newtons, 500 newtons sounds kind of bad right off the top, right? And you look at her and go, I'm pretty sure you don't weigh 500, you know. It's a big, like, piano kind of size thing. Yes, Jacob. Um, I was thinking... Um, Oh, every time like yeah, I hear you say like slugs as a measurement, I just imagine getting like some big slugs and just you know what I mean? No, but that's okay. I don't have to know what you mean. No, I just imagine... Are you imagining slugs like big chunks of metal because that's what it is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like the animal. And I'm thinking of like someone going out and grabbing slugs. No. Taking them. To... Slugs are basically shells without snails without their shells. Mm -hmm. That's what it amounts to. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there because we're going to get close to lunch. Let's see if we can get some of our... Um